Uncharted Drake's Fortune has everything that it's possible for a story to offer. Swashbuckling action, romantic mystery, zombie adventure, a jungle, the dialogue is snappy and witty, and the actors and animators consistently bring it to life. There is some tight and efficient level design here. You've got some really atmospheric moments and creepy, intriguing locations. Beautiful vistas. Basically, it's pretty cool. But you know what else is cool? Uh, Brink. Vanquish. Uh, Army of Two. These games have guns in them. Probably some of them have a jungle. So why aren't they just as popular and remembered? How come Nathan Drake gets a disappointing movie adaptation and these attempted Halo killers don't? I mean, it's all just guns and explosions at the end of the day, so what's so special about the Uncharted series in particular? Well, it all has to do with adventure. So buckle up, because today we're going on four of them. We'll be joining this beloved American man in sailing the seven seas and swinging from precarious heights across almost every continent on the earth. Uncovering unprecedented secrets and doing so with a ragtag bunch of lifelong pals, all to the tune of some of the most memorable strings and booming brass. This is one of my favorite pieces of media entertainment ever created. But after returning to these games after a few years, and kind of looking at them in a slightly different light, there are actually some things that I kind of don't like about them. And so today we're going to try to reconcile that with the renown and acclaim and enjoyment that has previously been attributed to the adventures of Nathan Drake. Here off the coast of Panama, where we just recovered what we believe to be the coffin of legendary explorer Sir Francis Drake. We begin the first Uncharted in the middle of Nathan Drake's adventure. He's found the notebook of his historical idol and namesake, and with a few more clues, he believes he can nail down the location of the lost city of El Dorado. We meet Victor Sullivan, father figure and mentor to Drake, who needs the money from the lost treasure to settle his debts. Elena Fisher is a reporter, and she loves making YouTube videos for the History Network, so she's gung-ho and actually pretty cheerful about risking her life to get this scoop. Now Nathan Drake, he's obviously some kind of history nerd. So this you see, Drake discovered something on that voyage, Sully. Something so secret and somehow caught up in the story of this 16th century privateer pirate who was apprenticed by a sailor and his family to join and eventually lead raids on Spanish colonies. Getting caught up in the naval rivalry between Elizabethan England and Philip II in Spain, even thwarting the legendary Spanish Armada, forever shaping the landscape of European naval power and leaving behind a legacy. Of All right, Nate, just pretend for a minute that I don't really care about any of that stuff and cut to the chase, would you? Basically, there might be some money involved. So, are you interested? Hell, goddamn Dorado. So they risk their lives to find a clue in a Nazi U-boat. I guess that's where they keep those. But Sully's debtors find him, He's kill Sully, and Nate and Elena crash land on the island they found. Oh, crap! This is a setback. It is a major downer. And Nate faces ruthless mercenaries, gruesome, elaborate death traps, the aforementioned jungle, and an angel of the Lord comes down from heaven to almost murder him for his transgression. <laughs> a good chunk of the early game consists in exploring this elaborate castle where, far from seeking the lost city or treasure, Nate's primary concern is finding Elena, first of all Elena. to see if she's even alive. She is. He gets shot at a lot, cheats death multiple times, and ultimately gets captured and imprisoned. Is that it? Elena saves him from that because this is an action movie, but once they find a quiet place to regroup, Nathan Drake says something that actually surprised me when I played through this again. That's our ticket out of here. Come on. Our ticket out of here? Are you giving up? Maybe you hadn't noticed, but we're kind of outnumbered. We're doing fine so far. Oh, Elena, I don't need your bullet-riddled corpse on my conscience. Let's go. He's done. He's already lost a friend. He doesn't want to lose another or die himself. The stakes are too high. The reward is too vague or too stupid. 
So he does the sensible thing and lets well and good be, cuts his losses, and calls it a day. So that's it. You're just gonna forget about the treasure and forget about Drake? <laughs> Going home is Drake's full intention for a couple of chapters here. Sure, Elena wants to stay and do the adventure, which is kind of cute, I guess, but this isn't up. Okay, this isn't Indiana Jones. This is real life. Nate has been, it seems, on enough of these little escapades to know when it's time to call it quits. And the only, only reason he doesn't sail home halfway through the game and end the franchise right there is because Elena finds out that Sully is still alive. So, far from searching for adventure, far from looking for gold or a lost city or a really funny DreamWorks film from 2000, Nate is there to find his dad, find a boat, and sail home safely after that. Isn't that right, Sully? We have everything we need, right here. All the clues to take us right to the treasure. Oh. So, apparently they're right next to the treasure, and they peer pressure Nate into... Finishing the adventure. Killing the Nazi zombies. Climb up this thing. Shimmy over here. Shoot another guy, and in the end, they make it out with not only their lives, but literally a boatload of treasure. And they even get one of those little romantic subplots to really round out the catharsis of the adventure. Like I said, this is everything you could ask for in a story. It's fun, succinct, polished, inoffensive, kind of wholesome at times, and it sort of has that Marvel movie digestibility that something with a little more chaos and politics and complicated game mechanics might be lacking. You almost start to wonder what another set of similar adventures could look like in a different setting. Like, what if this game had a sequel? But not so fast. Nathan Drake is rich now, so he's been taking his time, relaxing on a beach in the part of the world where they have beaches like this, just taking it easy, drinking an alcoholic beverage called Bloopy Book. I looked at this carefully. It is called Bloopy Book. And you know what? Good on him. After a hard day's work, sometimes it's good to just take it all in, sit in the shade, and enjoy life for a bit. So when this Australian man offers him another gig, he's like, no. He tells him the same thing he told Elena in the first game. It's not worth risking my life for an oil lamp. I don't want to go to prison. I don't even know what this is about. I don't get it. But Flynn's like, Nate, here's something written in Latin. Latin? You didn't, you didn't say you had anything written in Latin. I love it when shit's written in Latin. Uncharted 2 kicks everything Uncharted 1 did up to 11. This is the stuff that put Nathan Drake on the map. It's just one sprawling epic level after another, constantly topping itself with all these set pieces that, for the most part, are just so natural and fun to navigate. And then the seriousness and the stakes of the story are escalating too. I think there's some early shades of The Last of Us in this latter part of the crazy elaborate section of the game that takes place in the war-torn city. You have to carry this really likable man through all this horrifying chaos, desperately shooting people as you duck through doors and fences, the rain pouring down on the blood-soaked stains, sneaking between alleyways and broken buildings to avoid getting mowed down. This isn't even the level called Cat and Mouse. And what do you get for completing this grueling, nail-biting section? Did you carry him all the way from the temple? Shame. No! This game means business. Once again, an ally is dead, and the stakes are obviously way too high. So, Nathan Drake is, quite understandably, ready to call it quits. Look, I'm very grateful for everything you've done for me. I really am, but I'm through with all this. Everything I touch turns to shit. Nate. No, Elena, I'm done. Now, come on, I'm through playing the hero. But unlike the first game, where a personal motivation and some peer pressure keep him on the path to El Dorado. Uncharted 2 takes an entire level to take you aside 
and have Drake learn about the supernatural, potentially world-ending dangers that could be unleashed if his enemies found the lost city of Shambhala before he does. And we're basically asking Nathan, what kind of a hero are you? Why are you doing this? It seems there's just something inside of him that cannot let these matters go unsettled. So he continues to play this really high stakes and dangerous game Setting aside all reason, don't tell me you're buying into all that supernatural nonsense. And all concern for his safety to help the innocent, to set things right, save the world, and most importantly, kill the scary foreign man. Compassion is the enemy, mercy defeats us. And he wins. He realizes that his real love interest is the white girl and not the one that looks like a biker, completing his character arc of genuinely being a likable morally respectable hero and not just somebody that's out there for the thrills and then the third game i would say both for naughty dog and nathan drake it's just a victory lap This is where I discovered the series, when I was in junior high. This game stuck out to me because of how easy it was to insert myself in this very appealing, high production value power fantasy. I had the same initials as Nathan Drake, I kinda looked like this. Nathan Drake was just the wittiest and coolest generic white guy in the universe. Naughty Dog specifically set out to create an everyman that lots of people could relate to, that's why he wears a baseball shirt. And all of a sudden, we can insert ourselves into this fantasy of getting to travel to Istanbul, Borneo, Nepal, Tibet, the Himalayas, London, Cartagena, France, Syria, Yemen, Abbas, the Rubal Hali Desert. The guy's a hijacking, horse riding, stowawaying, desert surviving, face climbing, scuba diving, Chloe, uh, staying in the hotel with Sp And he does most of that in the downtime between the actual cool parts of the game. Sir Francis Drake was the first Englishman to circumnavigate the earth, and unless I'm mistaken, Nathan Drake became the first commercially successful video game character to do the same thing, besting swashbuckling and contemporary pirates, outsmarting warlords, unlocking unprecedented historical secrets and burning them to the ground when they reveal themselves to be dangerous temptations. Nate has a guiding purpose, a namesake whose example calls him again and again from the comforts of civilization into the majestic mysteries of the world of the past. His companion, again and again, tell him to go, go, find your destiny, uncover the secrets and the glories of the old kings and the cities of myth, learn the heights and the lows, the ingenuity and the weakness of all humanity. Drake, you have to believe. Oh. To share a name, or a likeness with somebody like that. All men dream. To have the courage to choose adventure over safety. Sick parvis magna? It means greatness from small beginnings. Love over pragmatic. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. To have this attitude of purpose and hopefulness. For they may act their dream with open eyes to make it possible. All of this, all the dreams, and the mirages, and the adventures, and the hopes, and the stories, and the hunts, and the stuff written in Latin, all of it, if you really pay attention, is clearly stupid and morally wrong. Wow. Now, tell me you don't have anything to do with you this. You get off on all this. Nate, these guys are playing for keeps. Listen, you've won, okay? You've outsmarted her. Why can't that be enough? You got your pride all tangled up in this thing. Cheating death. <laughs> <laughs> for what? For treasure? You do not belong out there. making you reckless. What are you trying to prove? Oh, man. This Nate, is about that Marlo woman. You're competing with, Who is it with you? a psychopathic war criminal. When you put it that way, it does sound pretty you stupid. You don't always have to play the bloody hero, you Sully. know? He listens to you. Please make him stop. You're no different from me, Nate. How many men have you killed? How many just today? Like almost all things nowadays, the legacy of Sir Francis Drake is muddled in uncertainty, 
Contemporary scholars aren't sure whether to be impressed with his trailblazing adventures, his contributions to the defeat of the Spanish Armada, and his contribution to the later dominance of English and its language, or whether to openly criticize and rebuke him for also being a pioneer of the English-African slave trade, potentially taking part in a massacre of innocent women and children in Ireland, executing a highly respected member of his crew for opposing him, losing battles and making poor calculations in his later career, and, you know, being a pirate. As far as I know, Francis Drake really did die off the coast of Panama, and to the extent that he's remembered as a hero, it's entirely for purposes of English nationalism, which I guess is cool if you're Charlie Cutter. You're bloody welcome, your majesty. But is that a real hero to be inspired by? Is that a real waypoint around which to organize your life? It's Drake. He never found it. He just died here. So much for greatness. Wasted his life for nothing. Each Uncharted game has a historical figure that serves as the background and inspiration for Nathan Drake's quest, and the apparent source or guide for a bunch of lost treasure. And they're all English or Italian men who carved out a small place for the English or European imagination to insert itself in another seemingly grandiose and mysterious place in the world. Although I'd love to, it's not within the scope of this video to break down their histories and the complicated, politically charged interpretations of the consequences and legacies of these adventurers and their legends. But suffice it to say that all the heroism and escapism of the Uncharted games kind of loses its luster, because even if you look past all the political and social questions, what you're basically left with is a story where these kooky, History Channel pseudo-archaeology people from your dad's PVR were right, and they really do get to fight the Nazis, even though it's 2008, and then find the Holy Grail in Newfoundland or whatever. I mean, just listen to this guy. But when he got back to England, Queen Elizabeth confiscated all of his charts and logbooks, including this one, and then swore his entire crew to silence. Yeah, so this you see, Drake discovered something on that voyage, Sully. Something so secret and so valuable, they couldn't risk it getting out. If you heard somebody saying that in real life, you would think that this man was a nutcase. Uncharted 4 is all about solidifying the end of this pointless, escapist fantasy. Uncharted 4 has a significantly different tone compared to the first three games. Having created The Last of Us, I feel like Naughty Dog had a certain newfound seriousness in their creative vision that was not going away, and it makes the first three games almost feel like they belong in a different cinematic universe. From the title screen, the stories of the first three games are mythologized, hinted at, mentioned, and retold, and it's basically expected that the player is familiar with them, like it's his superhero origin story. The whole game is basically about the fact that he can't and does not want to be like this anymore. The presentation, world building, and dialogue just goes way further at building a realistic and down-to-earth story. The dialogue and the characters were always lifelike and believable, but any whimsical cartoonishness from the previous games is almost entirely gone. Look at how Elena changes over the course of the series. In the first game, she's the most perky and lively character, taking unrealistic risks and somehow being even more rash and ambitious than Nate. What? In the second game, she's a little bit more mature and determined, like she's getting down to business and she knows what's going on. That adventure almost kills her as well, so maybe because of that, in the third game she almost seems jaded, serving almost exclusively as a voice of reason. Like, come on, Nate, don't let this get out of hand. And in the fourth game, she's just somebody's mom. Like, it almost feels like I've met her before, this is such a believable realistic character. The supernatural elements have a similar trajectory across the series. Drake's fortune straight up has zombies. Those are just real zombies, don't ask any questions. The second game has these blue people from Avatar, but they first have this disguise thing so it's like those monsters weren't real. The flame-headed djinn from Uncharted 3 are just a hallucination. They're not real at all. And the fourth game has no supernatural elements. So the whimsy and escapism of this whimsical escapist adventure 
is gradually depleting over the course of the series. By the time they're telling those stories to Cassie at the end of the game, it doesn't even seem all that believable that these two events are part of the same universe. It's almost like the original uncharted narrative voice is fading and it doesn't believe in itself anymore. You want to hear insane? Nathan Drake raced a madman and his entire army to the steps of Shambhal. Yes, Jesus. Nathan Drake found the lost city in the middle of the Rub al Kali desert. <laughs> Nathan Drake discovered the fabled El Dorado. <laughs> you know what, Nate? Underneath all the bravado, you're just a sad little boy with delusions of grandeur. You kill this villain in the final boss fight, but he's right. The Uncharted series is over. All of Nate's adventures have to have permits and be legal now. Playing as Cassie in the epilogue is almost like waking up from a dream where you turn off the video game and go back to the real world where all this stuff is just relics and legends and stories from the past the and there's no more immediate believability in it. You're saying that you were attacked by pirates after you found the coffin of Sir Francis Drake, is that right? Yeah, yeah that, pretty that's much right. it. Yeah. Bullshit. You might be able to settle down with someone. You might be able to have a house. You know, if you're renting. But other than that, and the paperwork, all you can do is sit there and play the latest Naughty Dog video game, Crash Bandicoot, investing yourself in some art or entertainment that makes you forget about your life and lets you be immersed in the idea that things are different and you're not in your house anymore. But you are. Suburbia is boring. Even if you like your job, it's going to have tedious and unfulfilling aspects as well. And there's so much undignifying paperwork that just weighs you down and weighs you down. And when it finally seems like you might get a little bit of an evening to yourself, all of a sudden there's dishes or laundry to do. Elena's probably not saying anything important right now. Maybe if I just daydreamed for a little bit, I could. Never mind. I forgot that trick. Look at the sun bearing down, like the weight of my responsibilities on these monotonous, identical blocks, inescapable kilometers of nothing but places to sit and wait for things to happen. You can't even enjoy the luxuries that this lifestyle is supposed to afford, because all of your time has to be spent maintaining and supporting it, and being inundated with endless sources of stress and distraction. Maybe I would like to travel. Maybe I would like to be a bigger person. A more exciting person, a globe-trotting, wise-cracking, temple-exploring marsupial. But I just don't have the time. There's far more immediate, more important responsibilities. All that adventurousness, that thing inside you that's craving something greater, it's just going to have to remain dormant, quiet, almost like it's in a prison. Samuel, come here. <sighs> Listen, the guards, they're singing. Eh, well, they're probably drunk. Perhaps, but they are content. How can they be content with their small lives, their miserable jobs? <laughs> I mean, they have wives to go home to. What do we got? Huh? No offense. We have ambition. No. Oh. And when we get out of here, that ambition will take us to places these idiots cannot even imagine. What is that Avery quote? I am a man of fortune, and I must seek my fortune. I like how he thinks. Listen, I'm, I can't. I'm, I'm out. What? No, I, I, I just don't do that kind of thing anymore. Maybe Nathan Drake just isn't a hero. And maybe we're just swept up in this fantasy. Not one with a destiny and a grand purpose. I think he genuinely likes this quiet and simple life. What would our lives have been like if we hadn't started by chasing these people who've been dead for hundreds of years? I suppose we can't blame him for sitting back and taking it easy on a beach with his wife and daughter. 
especially after such a physically taxing, stress-inducing career. Maybe that thing lingering inside of him that craved adventure was little more than the love and memory he had for his brother, Samuel, who really does seem to be the driving force, the impetus for Nate's life of crime and archaeology. So what do you say? Nathan Drake? Maybe the true call to greatness is really only appropriate at the right time for the right person. Across the Uncharted series, Naughty Dog transitioned from telling fun, ridiculous, cartoony stories to some of the most grounded and ruthlessly realistic stories out there. These are two different storytelling philosophies that resonate differently and serve different purposes. Do you just want to be entertained? Do you want an escapist fantasy? Or do you want to learn things about life? and overcome actual emotional, psychological challenges in a relatively safe environment. It might be fun to have all these surface level thrills, but sometimes it's just not as simple as finding something written in Latin and being thrust into the escapades of your destiny. Sometimes it's not even about these grand histories and mysteries and cultures, whether it be Latin or Spanish or whatever. Sometimes what it's really about is Portuguese. What? Quando seu marido volta para casa? What? What do I mean? How long before your husband gets home? Harvest Magna. Greatness from small beginnings. What's this? Now, think about what's in a, let's think a video game. What's in a video game? What are they finding in the video game that is obviously lacking in the real world such that they prefer the video world? Well, think about a video game. There's a clear narrative order. There's a story, and you play a pivotal role in realizing the purpose of that story. There's a nomological order. There are rules, and they make sense of that world, and you, if you follow the rules, the world unfolds according to that, those rules. So there's a narrative order, there's a nomological order, and there's a normative order. You know how to scale up, how to actually transcend. You level up in the game. And then within the game, you get into the flow state. You get into a state of intense at one minute. So what people are finding is at one minute within the three orders a narrative, nomological, and normative order. That's what they find lacking in the real world.